Hi everybody, and welcome to Once Upon a Scarf. Today we're taking a close look at a bandana by one of our most popular artists, who just this week celebrated her 94th birthday. As garments go, it's humble, but it holds the secrets of Yayoi Kusama's creative life, and possibly can provide inspiration for yours. I recently read Kusama's biography, and came to understand the arc of her life and work. It's amazing. The woman stands shoulder to shoulder with O'Keefe, Van Gogh, and Kahlo, both as a visionary and as a model for saying, the hell with all y'all, my visions will not be ignored. So on to today's scarf. It's perfect proof that you don't have to spend a fortune to live with great art. This one can sell on eBay and other outlets for over $50, but you don't have to spend that much. In the States, you can order it online from the Smithsonian. In the UK, you can get it from the Tate Modern. Or you can go straight to the source in Japan, the Lam From Company, which, for a tiny price and more expensive shipping, will send it straight to your door. There are two versions, one with Kusama's typical dots and the other with more doodly renderings, the one I have here. These little drawings are as much a part of Kusama's artistic vocabulary as the spotty pumpkins, but they're less well known. Kusama was born in 1929, 130 miles west of Tokyo. The family managed wholesale seed nurseries. Kusama's early childhood was grim. Her mother was abusive, which was to affect the little girl for the rest of her life. As a child, she sought refuge in the fields and greenhouses, sketching the plants in minute detail. As World War II began to deplete the country's resources, hunger became ever-present, and the pressure to sustain the crops became desperate. After the war, the teenage Kusama continued to work the harvests before going to art school in Tokyo. Driven to make art, she quickly ran into limits to her aspirations. She was later to write, Art like mine does battle at the border of life and death questioning what we are and what it means to live and die. Japan was too small, too servile, too feudalistic, and too scornful of women. My art needed more unlimited freedom and a wider world. She first moved to Seattle and then on to New York City, where by sheer force of will, she made her way repeatedly to the center of the artistic vortex. Be it abstract expressionism, minimalism, pop, and then on to live happenings and installations. She played on sex to attract the public eye, and even more so, her ever-present and underlying theme of obsession. Objects and images were repeated again and again in an attempt to soothe her inner demons with a ritualistic kind of physical mantra. Ultimately, she quit New York to return to Japan, she moved into a mental hospital and has lived there ever since. While it dates to 2004, its imagery harks back to the earliest days of Kusama's practice. This half-profile with an exaggerated, feminine eye looks out from and is embedded into the picture play. She witnesses, and she can't help but see, the eye is shocked wide open, the tiny little creatures that swarm the page. This world is alive, seething, these may be pearls, or larvae, or egg casings. These are mapped along with the other squirmies and flagella by letters that look like they belong in a scientific diagram. And above all, her trademark dots and spots. They cover the face here and the surface here. According to art historians, these dots are an attempt at self-obliteration, the small contained circles of darkness creating a gateway she can dissolve, split, and spread into, diffusing darkness's power. The multiples matter. As a child, she tried to center her chaotic thoughts by counting the endless pebbles on the riverbank behind her family house. But I think there may be another aspect to these dots that's less abstract and more immediately terrifying, deeply tied to her days as a hungry girl in war-wrecked Japan, working to sustain the family's crops. Her childhood art books are filled with drawings of leaves riddled with wormholes. 
Her family's battle was not so much against the Allies fighting elsewhere in the Empire, but against nature itself. The worms, eggs, fungi, and blight that imperiled their ability to earn a living and to put food on the table. Nature dots its fruits as well, with spores, and to a starving child in a field with a family dependent on the harvest, that vision is truly a nightmare. Part of a scarf's value is its scarcity. This one is not scarce. You could say it's being produced into infinity. But that doesn't matter. It holds an incredible lesson for anyone aspiring to create great and lasting art. Confront your monsters, blot them, impale them, release them on paper or canvas again and again and again. Diminish them by multiplying them down into specks. Make your world our world. Make your nightmares aesthetic to the point where their power over you is tamed. But others, for reasons they can't quite explain, are unable to tear their eyes away. And that's today's scarf story. I hope you enjoyed it. Please press the usual buttons to see more.